We would like to go over the Pythagorean theorem, and we don't just want to know the a squared plus b squared equals c squared or the hypotenuse squared. We want to make sure we understand sort of how, to th how things work uh, and how the angle and the sides kind of work together in triangles. Um, if you were to take a right triangle and draw it, What we can see here when we're looking at the right triangle, draw another line, is that this angle that's now a right angle, if I were to make it obtuse, when I make the angle wider, if we imagine the line outside here, you notice when the angle gets bigger, that line gets bigger. When the angle gets smaller, that, ang that line would get smaller. So the connecting line, that third line that's not connected now, right? as I make the angle larger, that line would have gotten larger. So now the third side would be this big. But if I made the angle smaller or acute, it gets smaller. So this helps us to understand that this angle always controls the opposite side. And we're going to use that idea to make sure we can always locate the hypotenuse. So when we take a right triangle, we know that the largest angle is 90, because you can't have two angles more than 90. It'll make more than 180. You're only allowed 180 when you add the three angles of a triangle. It has that constraint. So we always talk about the hypotenuse being across from the 90 degrees, because it's across from the biggest angle. And so it is also the biggest side. So the biggest angle is across from the biggest side. The biggest side is across from the biggest angle. So we can kind of even look at the other angle that's in the top, bottom right. This looks like the smallest of the three angles, just by looking at it with our eyeballs and not really measuring it. And you can clearly see that this is the smallest side. So the ones that are up across from each other, they go together. So the angle that's the medium angle in green is going to be connected to and controlling the green side across from it. So we can find the biggest side by going across from the right angle. And that will be what we call our hypotenuse. So our hypotenuse is always across from the right angle. So when we do the equation of a squared plus b squared equals c squared, that's our Pythagorean theorem, we learned earlier that uh, this is also where we get the distance formula from, is plugging coordinates into this uh, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So the c squared is the hypotenuse. It's the longest side across from the right angle. The other two sides are what we would consider a and b, any other numbers. And so the hypotenuse we would consider the c. So when we're solving a right triangle, you might be missing the hypotenuse call it x and make it, I don't know, 3 and 8. So we simply, we could notice or circle the hypotenuse and know that the other two are the sides that go together on one, on one side of the equal sign and the hypotenuse goes by itself on the other side. So then the next step, the final step, would be to square these. 3 times 3 is 9 and 8 times 8 is 64. And we add them together. When we add them together, we get uh, 73. And when we're solving 2x equals 10, we do the, the opposite. Two times, we do the opposite. We divide both sides when we're solving to get x alone. So we're going to do the opposite of x squared in order to get x by itself. So we're going to square root both sides. So the opposite of squared is square root, and that'll leave us with just 1x instead of x squared. So we're going to look at using a calculator sometimes to find the final answer, and other times we're going to reduce. So if I take a calculator and I take 73 and click the square root button, the one with the 2 next to it, okay, the other one's what we call cubed root, we'll use again one day. So we click square root of 3 and we get 8.54. Having 8.54, we usually almost always round to the nearest tenth in my class, so it would be 8.5, because the 4, we would round down. If it was 5, 6, 7, 8, or 9, we would round it up to 8.6. So we have 
a basic idea of the uh, hypotenuse is the largest side. It's across from the 90. The other two sides we put by themselves, but the x or the missing one could be in any of those spots. So let's try another one. So what if the variable or the x is not where the hypotenuse is and you have the hypotenuse as a number? Well, in this case, we again, we can go across from the 90 and circle it and that will be the one that's our hypotenuse. So we square the other two and add them and we set it equal to 10 squared, the hypotenuse squared. So we get 36 plus x squared equals 100. And so just like we did opposites when we square rooted, we're going to do the opposite of plus 36. We're going to subtract 36 on both sides. And that's what gets x squared by itself. So x squared is 64. Uh, what we're going to see and want to review is sometimes when we have perfect squares or square roots that are not perfect, but we want to know how to leave the square root sign and do an imperfect square or when it's perfect square, how to take it out. So 64 is 8 times 8. And we learn when we have a pair of something, because we're talking about the sides of a triangle or a square with an area of 64, the two sides would be 8 and 8. 8 times 8 gives you 64. So really square roots are, are getting the pairs of sides and then we just use one of them. So the final answer will be 8. So whenever we have a pair, we take them out of the square root sign. So I notice that 8 times 8 is 64. If I didn't notice that and I started to reduce it, maybe I'll do that up here, I have to take 64 and break it down. It's 2 times 32. I'm done using that. It's 2 times 16. I'm done reducing that. 2 times 8. I'm done reducing that. And 2 times 4. I'm done reducing that. And 2 times 2. So really the factors, if we break it down to as many multiples as we can, is 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2. So there's going to be 6 of them. 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 makes 64. So we will do the same thing. We'll take out the pairs. So it, it doesn't help us to break it down. and It actually helps us to see the 8 and 8 sooner. So you see the perfect square, you know it's 8. But if you have to factor it down, we still look for pairs. A pair of 2s, a pair of 2s, and a pair of 2s. So whenever you have a pair, you take them outside of the square root sign, and you end up taking all three pairs out. And 2 times 2 times 2 is 8. So you get the same answer if you see the perfect square right away, or if you don't see the perfect square right away. Um, let's do one more with, a, with an imperfect square, where we'll have some square root left over. But again, we want to just point out that the first thing we did is we saw the right angle, we went across and circled, that would be our hypotenuse. This way we never make a mistake and put it in the wrong position. So, let's try another example. Uh, let's use a small number, 2 and 5. So looking at this one, we're going to see that the hypotenuse is the x. And everything's already on one side, 4 plus 25. Oh, and that doesn't give us an imperfect square that we could use. We'll just leave it, but... When we're finished adding 25 plus 4, we get 29. And then again, to get x by itself, whenever we're using algebra, we do opposites. So to get x squared, we do the opposite, the inverse is square root. That will make just 1x. So the square root of 29, if we don't use a calculator, we find that you cannot reduce it. There's no numbers that you can multiply to make 29. So we would just leave it. So sometimes they want you to plug it into the calculator, you get a little bit more than 25, so a little bit more than 5. The square root of 25 is 5. So the square root of 29 is probably like 5.2 or 5.3, and it's 5.38. So sometimes you'll see it with the square root, and sometimes we'll use it as a decimal, but it's really important in Algebra 2 and in, in higher maths that we do know how to reduce when we can possibly factor. So let's look at one example of just factoring, or maybe two. So what happens when we get the square root of 50? We start to break it down, we get 2 times 25, I'm done using that one, 
and then 5 times 5, I'm done breaking down those ones. So the square root of 50 is really 2 times 5 times 5. Write it down. Write the whole, write each step. Write your little umbrella, your square root umbrella. And then we circle, or what some people call the peanut, put a little peanut around the pair. So the pair we can take out. And we're left over with a 2. So whatever we're left over, we multiply it back together. Whatever we take out, whatever two things we take out turns into 1. So let's try another one. Uh, let's try 24. Or let's make it 48. So if we take out 48, uh, you notice maybe that it's not a perfect square. 7 times 7 is 49. That would be a perfect square. So we start to break it down. It's even, so we could divide it by 2. We could divide it in the calculator by 2, and we would get 24. 2 times 24 makes 48. Okay, we divide it by 2 again, it would be 2 times 12 makes 24. So I circle the ones I'm done factoring so I don't forget about them, because sometimes we forget and we, we leave them out. So uh, I could do 2 times 6. Let me do a bigger number, 4 times 3, right? So the 3 I'm done with, the 4 I'm still factoring, 2 times 2. So we want to be careful, we want to be organized. Math's not about always doing things as fast as you can. So when we organize and look at it, it's 2 times 2, times 2 times 2 times the 3. So one thing we can do is we can pull up our calculator and make sure we did it right if we want to check our work. 2 times 2 times 2 times 3. It should equal what we started with, 24. So it didn't. It should equal to 48. Uh, what am I missing? I might have only done 3. 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 3. So it is 48. So when you add or multiply them back together, you can check to see if it's what you started with. Then you know you factored it correctly. If it doesn't multiply to what you started with, then you know you made a mistake. So the factors of 48 are 2 times 2 times 2 times 3. We're going to circle the pairs and take out 2 and take out another 2 and we're left with the radical 3. So if there was another number like 5, we would multiply 5 times 3 is 15 and we would actually write it down as 15. Um, but there's only one number left over so we'll put that there. We took one 2 pair out and another pair of 2's so we have 2 pairs of 2's. 2 times 2 will equal 4. So again, when we factor a square root, we're taking out the pairs. Let's pretend I have a, a third problem. Let's pretend I'm factoring 2 times 2 times 2 times 3 times 3 times 3 times 5 times 5. How would I do that? So we want to circle the pairs. So we have a pair of 2s, we have a pair of 3s, we have a pair of 5s. So those three things we're going to take out. And everything we were doing at the beginning was multiplying. So when we take it out, we multiply them. Okay, But for every two of them, we're in, we end up pulling out one. Because what a square root is asking is, if you have the number four as an area, what are the roots of one side? The area would be two times two to make four. One of the sides would be two. So that's why we look and we see a pair. We take it out. and we are looking at only one because we're asking what's only one of the sides of a square that has an area of four. So there's a video if you want to watch about what square roots really are in, in my channel. But the pair we took out of two, the pair we took out of three, the pair we took out of five. We have a two left over and we had a three left over. And again, everything we were doing was multiplying. We factored this, these are multiples. So then now that we've done our pairs and we've collected everything, we multiply them all back together. So our final answer inside is 6, 2 times 3, the 2 and the 3 that were left over. And the numbers that we took out each pair, we multiply them, 2 times 3 times 5, which is 30. So again, this is something we did in pre-algebra. We did it in algebra. We're going to use it now. We're going to use it later this year again, and we're going to use it in algebra 2. So we really want to review making, um, doing the Pythagorean theorem and then turning 
uh, the final answer into a square root so that we can do it without a calculator sometimes. Um, so hopefully this helps to refresh your memory and you can do some of the basic Pythagorean theorem problems.